Hello everyone. Now we are going to move on to our next lecture, which is about the diversity of life. So we are going to learn about the domains of life and taxonomic hierarchy. What were the two types of cells that we learned about in the first unit? They were prokaryote and eukaryote. And what are the two domains that have the prokaryotic cell? We can see them here. Bacteria and archaea. What is the one domain that has eukaryotic cells? They are simply called eukaryotes. Within eukaryotes, we have four kingdoms of life, or we can say four large groups of life. Protists, eumycetes, um, plants and animals. To better describe organisms and place them in categories that are related, we use a scheme called the taxonomic classification. A taxon is a group of organisms, such as the domestic cat is one taxon within the group Felidae, or we can say the family Felidae, which is right here. The leopard is another taxon within this group. So here is an illustration of a leopard. The taxonomic hierarchy places organisms such as a leopard in levels from the most specific, or we can call it species, to the most broad level that include includes all the organisms related to it. In this example, example, leopard is a species of the genera Panthera. Tiger is another species in this genera. Both are in the family Felidae, which is in the order Carnivora which is in the class mammal. In English, we call this a phylum. You would call it embranchma. We call it chordata. And they are in the kingdom animalia, which we know is in the domain eukaryotes. So all the organisms in the domain eukaryote has eukaryotic cells. Here is another way to visualize the taxonomic hierarchy. Here again, we see the species leopard. This is the species name. Here is the genera. It's in the family Felidae, which are cats, big cats and little cats, domestic cats and wild cats. This family is one of several families in the order Carnivora. Carnivore refers to animals that eat meat. All the animals within carnivora are meat eaters. However, we have these three groups of animals, or these three families, which are different from each other. Cats are different from dogs. But within the dog family, we have the genus Canis, and this shows two species of Canis. How, however, there's many species. 
But this animal, Canis latrans, is more closely related to this wolf, Canis lupus, than it is the panther or the leopard. Notice the use of the Latin name. So here, Taxidea taxus. Here we have a French name, which I am not familiar with. I call this animal a badger. The Latin name is also called the scientific name. It consists of two parts, the genus, and the species name. Because of these two parts, this is also called binomial nomenclature. Bi means two. Nomen refers to name. Why do we need the Latin name? Well, let's look at this example of a rat. In English, I call this a rat. What do you call it in Creole? You call it a rat. So we are able to understand what each other is saying. The binomial nomenclature or the two names is Rattus norvig norvegigus. norvegicus. I don't know Latin, maybe you guys have taken Latin. Okay, so someone in Russia who calls these animals a completely different name than us, they will understand this name, Rattus norvegicus. Let's look at this bird. What do you call this bird? In Creole, it's taco. It's called a taco cabrit, but in English, I call it a bay-breasted because it's bay is a color, breast is the same as chest, cuckoo. So in English, all tacos, we call them cuckoos. However, in English, we have this food here that we call a taco. So if you go up to an American and you tell them, I have a taco, they will think you're giving them food and not a bird. We are going to explore the domains in more details and the types of organisms that are found in each domain. We are going to start with the domain of organisms that have prokaryotic cells. This is the bacteria and the archaea. They have some things in similar, such as they are microscopic, they are unicellular, and they do not have a nucleus. They do not have organites with membranes. Or in other words, their organelles do not have membranes. This is different than the eukaryotes. Bacteria and archaea are the smallest organisms. They're about one-tenth the size of a eukaryote. They are found everywhere that life exists. The weight of all the prokaryotes in the world is 10 times the weight of all the eukaryotes. So there's many, many more prokaryotes than there are eukaryotes. Humans are in the domain eukaryote, but we have many, many prokaryotes living within our own body. We call this the microbiota of our body. It is a community 
of microorganisms that live within our body. The number of prokaryotic cells outnumbers the number of our body cells 10 to 1. So in other words, there's 10 times as many prokaryotic cells in our body than our own cells. The weight of these prokaryotic cells within our body is 2 to 5 pounds. We acquire them by the time we are two years old, and this number then becomes fairly stable throughout our life. The prokaryotes protect us and help us in many ways. They prevent disease organisms from growing in our body. They produce vitamins and help us to digest food. They may even play a role in maintaining a healthy weight and immune system. These are the most common shapes of prokaryotes. Spherical, baton, and helicoidal. Spherical here, just for how it sounds, it's shaped like a sphere. They can live by themselves, in pairs, or in chains, or in masses. So you may have heard of Staphylococcus or Streptococcus. They are spherical bacteria. The prokaryotes, shaped like batons, can live singularly or in chains, like streptobacilles. And finally, we have the helicoidal prokaryotes, which form, sphere, which form spirals. So I call this a spiral in English. And spirochetes, such as this one here, is, uh, forms a spiral. Prokaryotes are very important for us. Their roles in metabolizing or using oxygen can be put into three groups. There's strict, aerobes, strict anaerobes, and facultative anaerobes. The strict aerobic prokaryotes use oxygen for their respiration and they cannot live without it. They are strictly needing air such as this mycobacterium tuberculosis bacteria. Next, we have strict anaerobes. This means they do not need oxygen to live. And some of these are used in fermentation. Here's an example, Clostridium botulinum. It secretes a toxin that can harm us. So if you have food growing without air getting to it, sometimes this bacteria will start to grow and the thing that can hurt you is the toxin that it produces. We also have another group of anaerobes called facultative anaerobes. Facultative means they can live with it or they don't need it. It's not strict. So 
They use oxygen if they can find it, but they also don't need it. The way an organism gets its nutrition can be put into two groups. One is autotroph that we'll talk about here. The other is heterotroph. Hetero, which we will talk about in a couple slides. So for now we are talking about autotroph. Autotrophs make their own food. So auto means self. They make food themselves. They can make food either from light, photo autotroph, or chemicals, chemio autotroph. If they're making their food from light, they're getting it from the sun. If they're making it from chemicals and they're autotrophs, they're getting it from inorganic chemicals, such as hydrogen sulfur, ammonia, or iron. Their source of carbon comes from carbon dioxide or something similar. There are photosynthetic prokaryotes, just like plants are photosynthetic. We also have prokaryotes that are photosynthetic. They're called cyanobacteria. Other prokaryotes that are photoautotrophs, like we said, plants, and some proteists, which we'll learn about later. Some prokaryotes get their food from chemicals like sulfolobus. What word do you see here? Sulfur. What do you think it uses? Sulfur. Here is a type of colonial prokaryote called cyanobacteria. The genus name is Anabena. It has these things called heterocysts that it uses to get nitrogen. It also has photosynthetic cells. Now we're going to talk about heterotrophs. There are two types of heterotrophs. One is photo which uses the sun, just like we described for the photoautotroph. One is chemio heterotroph, which gets its energy from organic compounds. What is the source of carbon for these? It is organic compounds, just like the food that we eat. So, it gets it from plants and animals and other living organisms. Here are some examples of photo heterotrophic prokaryotes. And there are many chemotrophic sh chemio heterotrophs that are prokaryotes. What are people? People are chemioheterotrophs because we get our food, we get our energy from our food. We also get our carbon from our food. There's also some plants that do this. They eat other things. They don't get their energy from the sun. We are going to continue exploring prokaryotes and look at the domain archaea. Archaea are extremophiles. So remember this word, extreme 
And file means love. So these organisms love extreme environments such as halo files love salt. Halo refers to salt. So they live in salty places like the Dead Sea in Israel. And let's look at the name, Halo Bacterium. It's a bacteria that loves salt. We also have thermophiles. They do well in, in hot environments, such as we mentioned the Sulfolobus. It lives in volcanoes, and volcanoes are very hot. hot. Volcanoes also have a lot of sulfur, so Sulfolobus uses sulfur as an energy source. Another type is methanogens. They use carbon dioxide and hydrogen and they breathe out methane. They produce methane. They are strict anaerobes. Oxygen will kill them. Oxygen equals death. Whoops. If you are a extreme anaerobe. These types of organisms weren't discovered until, or they were thought to be bacteria until 1977. And then scientists figured out that they are actually different. Let's look at the other domain that has prokaryotic cells. They are bacteria. They're very important in ecology. They are needed for plants to grow, for nutrients to cycle for decomposition and for the production of oxygen. There are also some that cause sickness. 10% cause sickness such as Vibrio cholera which causes cholera. However, there's also some that help us digest our food. Here is an example of rhizobian that lives on in the root nodules of legumes. That's going to be very important for you as agronomists. Okay, let's remember where we are in the lecture. We just looked at bacteria and archaea. Bacteria and archaea are in what kind of group? What is this grouping called? Domain. Okay. We're going to move on to eukaryotes. The domain of eukaryotes has four subgroups. What is this subgrouping called? Kingdom in English. So you may hear me call it King Dumb. The first kingdom that we will discuss are the Proteists. 
Protease are all the eukaryotes that are not plants, animals, or fungus. Some are unicellular, some are multicellular. The majority live in water, but some also live in dead leaves or in hosts. So if it's a eukaryote, but it's not a plant, animal, or fungus, we call it a protist. However, they do look like plants, animals, and fungus. For example, algae looks like a plant. Protozoans can look like animals. And mul, I think, is mold looks very similar to fungus. Okay. So we are going to look at algae, protozoans, and mold, which are organisms within the kingdom of protists. Here are four common groups of algae. The diatoms, green algae, brown algae, and, and dinoflagellates. Here's a picture of the diatoms. Very pretty. They're small microscopic organisms that are made of silica. They have glass lids that are made of silica. They photosynthesize an almost Half of the photosynthesis in the ocean is, comes from algae called diatoms. And what does photosynthesis produce? Photosynthesis gives us oxygen. So the ocean is very important for making oxygen. Almost half of the photosynthesis in the ocean comes from diatoms. So they are very, very, very important. The second group of algae is called green algae. They can be unicellular or multicellular. Here's two examples of green algae. They're green because they have chlorophyll. There's also brown algae. They are multicellular and they can be very large. There's an organism called giant kelp that is very important in the life cycle in the food chain in the oceans. And finally, we have dinoflagellates. They're common in the ocean. They can produce light at night. When an organism produces light, we call it bioluminescence. There's one type called red algae that produces a toxin that can kill animals and people. There's also a type called zooxanthellae that live in coral. When you take ecology, we'll learn about the zooxanthellae, so don't forget that word. Another type of protist that kind of acts like an animal is a protozoan. Some protozoans are parasites. 
they cause malaria or giardia. So here is the organism that causes malaria. Some protozoans are predators like paramecium or amoeba. Here's an amoeba. It eats its food by surrounding it with its body. And this body is a single cell. Here we see the food. This paramecium is a single cell. But it is also a predator. And finally, here is the group of protists that act like fungus. They are consumers that absorb their food. For example, in English, I call this slime mold. Slime mold. They are made of single cells that come together to form reproductive structures. So on a mold, this thing here is the reproductive structure. This little thing has spores in it that allow the mold to reproduce. Let's move on to another kingdom within the domain eukaryote. We'll talk about the kingdom Eumycetes. In English, I call these fungus. Some are multicellular, like champion. I call, in English, champion is called mushroom. Some fungus are unicellular, like this, which is called yeast in English. They decompose organic materials and recycle the nutrients. They absorb their nutrients. They have these structures called hyphae. Which consist of the reproductive part of the fungus. And these things called mycelium, which are a continuous network of hyphae. The hyphae are the parts that absorb the food and break down organic material. This kingdom of Eumycetes is very important in the environment. Most plants have a mutualistic relationship with fungus. 80% of plants depend on fungus for their growth. And here we see some pictures of fungus inside of plant roots. Here are some uses of Eumycetes for humans. We eat them. This is a champion. We use them to make medicine, like penicillin. The antibiotic penicillin is, comes from a fungus. We use, what's this word in English? Yeast. Oops. We use yeast to make beer and to make bread rice. Fungus is also used 
to make cheese. And these little things are pieces of fungus inside a piece of cheese. Some eumycetes are pathogenic. They cause disease in humans. They can spread throughout the body and are very dangerous. So here's something in French. In English, we call it ringworm because it forms rings, but it's not really a worm. It is a fungus. It also causes diseases in plants like this type in corn and ergot in wheat. So this is going to be very important to you plant agronomists. Let's review what we learned in this lesson. I want you to be able to recite the taxonomic hierarchy. So here is an exercise I'd like you in your notebook individually to write out each level of the taxonomic hierarchy. And I want you to be able to say it as quickly as I can in English. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genius, species. So you should be able to say that in French. And then under the domain eukaryote, there are four kingdoms. Please write those down and write down the kingdom of mule, moule, chat, and champion. So Elio can pause and give you about five minutes to do that. And next we will go to video 4B about plants and viruses. So see you there.